What's up, guys? Usually I give the date and, uh, you know, the date and uh, what day it is and, and everything that's going on, but I'm not quite sure if I'm uploading this immediately uh, as we speak or if I'm waiting a couple days, but uh, I just got done having a great 40-minute uh, interview with none other than Dr. Joe Jorgensen, uh, as you saw in the intro clip, Right there, uh, the 2020 Libertarian presidential candidate. And uh, Dr. Jorgensen and I sat down and had an amazing 40-minute uh, conversation. Originally, I was only uh, told that I was only going to have her for about 15 to 20 minutes, so I thought it was going to be a shorter episode. But uh, she gave me extra time, and uh, I made as wise of use of it as I could for you guys. Uh, and, and you're going to be, I, I think you're really going to love this interview, um, it feels really big for me uh, because I have interviewed candidates who, are, who have been seeking nominations and all that. I, I have not ever, this is the first time I've ever been able to sit down with somebody officially nominated uh, for, a, for a candidacy position like this. And uh, Joe Jorgensen's running a, you know, a nationwide campaign trying to take on Donald Trump and Joe Biden. This, this was uh, fascinating to me that I had the opportunity to, to have Dr. Jorgensen on the show. And if you don't know about um, Joe Jorgensen, let me tell you just a little bit about her. Dr. Jorgensen uh, was born and raised in Libertyville, Illinois. Libertyville. Come on. Come on. She received a bachelor's in psychology at Baylor University in 1979, followed by a master's in administration from Southern Methodist University in 1980. Uh, she began a career at IBM working with computer systems, leaving there to become a part owner and president of Digitech Incorporated. She received a Ph.D. in industrial and organizational psychology from Clemson University in 2002 and is a psychology senior lecturer at Clemson University. She was also... Harry Brown's 1996 Libertarian vice presidential candidate in which uh, she was nominated on the first ballot with 92% of the vote and they received nearly half a million votes, uh, which at that time was the best performance since 1980 by the Libertarian Party. Uh, she is a fascinating individual to speak with and rather than sit here and just drum up and hype and hype, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I want you to get into the interview. It's it's 40 minutes long, and it's great. And we talk about a, a host of topics from what's going on right now with criminal justice reform, the Black Lives Matter movement, protest, COVID-19, federal government versus local government, taxes, schooling, all, all this stuff pops up. Uh, so if you're not well-versed in who Joe Jorgensen is or her positions— uh, policy positions on, and how she wants to take on Donald Trump and Joe Biden and appeal to you as a voter, this is the episode, man. This is the episode to see. So get ready. Tighten your seatbelt because we're going to jump right into it. Get ready. Here we go. So, ladies and gentlemen, my guest this week is the Libertarian presidential candidate, Dr. Joe Jorgensen. Dr. Jorgensen, thank you for coming on the program today. Oh, my pleasure. Glad to be here. All right. Well, uh, first off, congratulations on securing the Libertarian nomination. That was a that was a couple weeks ago, um, and it was in a, uh, a different sort of setting than normal. Yes. <laughs> um, coronavirus obviously has been changing a lot of things up. Uh, one of the first things I wanted to ask you, uh, we were just talking off air. You said you uh, checked in at Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, how has how has campaigning been? Over these last couple of weeks, because I know there's still coronavirus restrictions in different states. There's different things going on. Is that is that a hassle? Is it like every everywhere you go, you got to learn a new set of rules or, or what's going on? Well, actually, because of coronavirus, I haven't been traveling nearly as much as I would have. However, what I am doing is I'm traveling to the states which uh, need our help with ballot access. Now, here I'm on campaign business, so I'm not here for ballot access, but I went to New Hampshire and I went to Minnesota because uh, I'm not on the ballot yet there, and so we're working on that. Because again, the Democrats and Republicans, they hold a monopoly, and they know that if people hear our message, they'll realize that there's something better out there. 
that's uh, that's something that uh, a, a lot of I guess a lot of people assumed with how Gary Johnson and, and Bill Well performed and all that. They didn't think ballot access was an issue, but from from the way that you're making it sound, it it very much is. It depends state to state on whether or not you're on the ballot or not, and what what you have to complete to get onto it. Yeah, well, two things. First of all, uh, we were in back-to-back presidential elections on the ballot in all 50 states starting back in the 90s. And then the Democrats and Republicans, after seeing us do that on multiple uh, elections, said, "Uh uh-oh, we got to do something. And so they set about increasing the standards. And so actually, 2004, we were not on the ballot in all 50 states. So we've had to work extra hard since then. Now, additionally, we've got the coronavirus. So what's going on is the governments, some states, some state governments will say, okay, you need however many signatures, 5,000, 10,000, whatever. And then they'll say, but there are no festivals, Uh, You can't be outside in groups larger than 10 or 20 or whatever. So even if we did collect the signatures and turn them in, they would probably say, well, you obviously broke the law to do this. So, you know, they, they, they just keep putting obstacles in front of us. Extra hurdles. Yeah. It sounds, sounds like it. And under the guise of coronavirus. um, Exactly. uh, So obviously that has to be some impediment on traveling too, uh, I would imagine. Yeah, as I mentioned, um, I've only gone to two states uh, to campaign, and both of those were states in which I was not on the ballot yet. By the way, I'm already on the ballot on about 43 or 44 states, so there aren't many left. I will be going to the National Convention, of course, and Freedom Fest, and then, again, off to other states that need help with ballot access. Actually, I think I'm going to one, yes, I'm going to one state for ballot access before the convention. But uh, we're just not traveling the way that uh, Gary Johnson and Bill Weld did. We're not even traveling the way we did in 96. Um, I was the 1996 VP nominee with Harry Brown, and we certainly traveled a lot more back then. So with that, um, on top of the coronavirus thing, it it seems like one of the the issues in the forefront right now is uh, the protests that are going on, the calls for criminal justice reform and police reform and all that. Uh, I, I know, I know uh, from your social media that you attended uh, a couple of vigils and a couple of rallies and all that. Um, what what were those experiences like? Uh, because as as far as I can tell, at least anyway, you're the only one out of out of Trump and Biden. I don't believe that they've been on the ground uh, amongst the people at these kind of events. They've been doing you know more publicity type of things. How has that been for you? Well, I think you do need to experience some of this. So I did just get back from Minneapolis a couple days ago, and it's a completely different thing to actually be there and see where it happened than to see it on the news. And I saw that video play over and over on the news, but you know, being there is completely different. And I hope that a movement is sparking. A lot of people don't realize that shortly after the slaves were freed, we had institutionalized racism built into the law. And even today, there are a lot of things that people don't even realize. For instance, with drug laws, um, uh, drugs that people of color use have much harsher uh, sentences, such as crack cocaine, than drugs that whites use, which would be, for instance, cocaine. So there is racism inherent in the system that people don't even realize. That is, um, it's a very like passionate and touchy subject for people um, mm-hmm. to, to get into this, especially when you've seen uh, many of the protests that are going on are peaceful. Like, like there are events that happen, people are there. It's peaceful. There's no violence. There's there's nothing of that sort. But then something happens afterwards. You know, people, opportunists come out, rioters come out, and there's looting and and tearing down of statues and all that. And and people get really worked up and talking about it. Um, what approach do you think is the best when talking to to people? Because there, there's obviously two two different schools of thought here. There's there's the people who feel like they're not being heard, that they're not being represented, and that nothing is being done. And then there's people who are looking at, you know, things like statues toppling down and just thinking that people are tearing apart history. Where is a balance in talking to both of these groups of people? Because uh, the media, at least anyway, is never going to paint that there's a unity angle here. They, they love the division. They love to fuel it. They love people passionately being on one side or the other. 
how do how do we tackle into the middle there and really you know help both sides explain what's going on? Well, rather than explaining, I think we need to do. And one thing we need to do is to drastically cut government. For instance, right now, um, the government divides you because you can't make your own decision. For instance, let's say you want prayer in the school. Well, maybe your next door neighbor doesn't. So what you have to do is you have to both vote, you have to go fight it out at the ballot box, and you have to basically be political is government so small that people got to keep their own funds, we would eliminate the income tax, for instance, and then people would be able to make their own choices. So you could choose your school, you could choose your health care, you could choose your retirement, rather than having to do all of that through the government. That way people could live peacefully and you can get along with your neighbors because you know what, they can have the kind of school they want and you get the kind of school you want. Same with health care, same with retirement, which we've got a broken social security system and on down the line. So what we need to do is get government out of these so people can go back to living normal lives do you think that angle kind of goes buried in the sand i mean obviously you're not going to hear donald trump really talk about uh eliminating government from something we we know from his actions that he has his own brand of authoritarian uh and then joe biden joe biden has 30 plus years uh of being and and directly contributing to policies that are in place right now I, I find it kind of funny when I'm watching Joe Biden talk about how he's going to fix the system when he's for, – for longer than I've been alive, he was sitting in the Senate chambers uh, driving many of, of the policies and, and the laws that are on the books right now. He, he has a direct hand in. Yeah, it would be hysterically funny if it weren't so tragic, these people saying, just give me the chance and I will fix it for you. Meanwhile, you've never lived as a private citizen in your entire life. You have been in charge of the government for 40 years. So why is this year going to be any different? Why is this year going to be different from last year, from 2011, from 1998, from 1976? Just go on back. It's absurd. And you mentioned Trump. You know, Trump came in saying, look, I'm an outsider. And, and in many regards, he was. He didn't have 40, 50 years of political favors to repay on his way up. And he came in and said, I'm going to get rid of the deficit. We're going to bring in smaller government. And what do we have? We have a deficit that's getting larger and larger under Trump. And if somebody like an outsider can't come in under the Republican Party name and make government smaller, then you know it's hopeless to ever expect any Republican to make government smaller. Absolutely. Um, in talking with, well, in looking at the voting body of people, um, I, I would I would argue that this isn't a carbon copy of 2016. I think 2016 looked a little worse in terms of uh, in terms of Trump and Clinton. Uh, I think it's a little bit less with Trump versus Biden, but it's still there. What do you mean worse? Worse in what way? Worse? Worse in what way? In in the sense, like, I feel like 2016 was, uh, like, you couldn't have found two worse people to put oh, against each okay. other. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, I feel like, I feel like right now, although I will, I will admit, the longer it goes on, the more it seems Joe Biden seems to slump. Like, these things come out about, you know, something that he passed in the 70s or the 80s, something that he's directly had a hand in. Uh, so he's he's on a downswing, in, in my eyes, at least anyway. Uh, right. And, and in fact, recent statistics showed that both Trump and Biden had negative ratings. And that's the first time that's happened in a presidential race. Uh, ra rather, well, it's the second time it's ever happened. The first time it happened in 2016. So you're right. These are different times. Yeah, these uh, these are very different times. We know that uh, there's some, you know, voters that you, you probably can't tap. Donald Trump probably has a wing of people that you couldn't convince to vote against him. Joe Biden has a wing of voters who are never Trump and and believe that the primary goal is just to get him out of office. But to me, at least anyway, the, the way that I look at that, there's a lot of disenfranchised people in between who who know that they wouldn't vote for Trump. They can't get behind the idea of just getting him out of office because it's not it's not really accomplishing anything. So. You as a libertarian coming in, is there a certain demographic of voter? Like, are you looking at voters that specifically have chosen not to vote 
over the past couple of years by the data uh, or the independence? What, what's the strategy when you look at the body of voters that are available? Oh, absolutely. First of all, we do draw votes from the Democrats and Republicans who are just fed up with the same old, same old. They're people who are looking for a change, a real change. However, most of the people who vote for us tend to be uh, independents or people who have never voted. And right now, uh, surveys show that there are about 40 to 45 million voters out there who do lean libertarian. Either they've never heard of the party or they don't know much about the party, but if you ask them what their beliefs are, their beliefs are much more towards the libertarian end than either the Democrat or the Republican end. Absolutely. So when we start talking about libertarian ideas and libertarian approaches to libertarian solutions to these problems, obviously we can see because we're in this party, we've done this investigation. We know that government tends to be the driving issue of a lot of the problems. How yeah. do we appeal to voters who, or how do we how do we educate voters even to that idea that you know, hey, you, you don't like this, but have you thought about how this is the things that the government has put in place, and this is how it has negatively impacted? Well, yeah, first of all, I think this is the year for a couple of reasons. A lot of people, well, the reason that the polls got it wrong with Trump, the reason he won and the polls all said he was going to lose is because they weren't polling people who had either never voted or hadn't voted in 20 years. So you had all these people dusting off their voting cards or registering because they were sick of things. And now they see Trump gave them the same thing. So I'd like to say, hey, we're here. Also with the coronavirus, um, you know, I, I began to get really sad, like maybe our country has lost its independence. And let me mention, three of my grandparents are immigrants. So I would hear stories about the old country and how great America is and how, uh, you know, land of the free, home of the brave, how here you get to make de decisions, you get to make your choices. And if you work extra hard, you get to keep the money. So um, I, I was really worried about Americans losing their independence, their feistiness. And then came the coronavirus. And then came the house arrests where we're all told to stay home. And then people started fighting it. So all those people in Michigan, for instance, who are driving around the Capitol, all these people all over the country who are just saying, no, we're not going to sit at home anymore. I hope that they will take a look at the Libertarian Party when they realize that it doesn't matter if you're talking about Democrats or Republicans. Both of them want to be your mom or your dad. And we're the only ones who say you are an adult. You should be treated like an adult. And we will give you the individual liberty and the responsibility that goes with it. There's a couple of things you mentioned I want to touch up on, and I'm just trying to figure out in my head where I want to go with this. Um, <laughs> I want to go to polling, but I'll go I'll go to polling in a minute because coronavirus came up, and that's an, that's another big issue. Uh, with coronavirus, everybody wants to. All my friends who aren't libertarians who know, you know, my views of the government and all that, they always ask me, you know, what's the libertarian approach to coronavirus or whatever, and I, I feel like it's a complicated answer because we're not. We're not saying that uh, you know there should be a, a government with an iron fist that says, "Hey, we're shutting it all down. You got to stay home. You're out of a job, uh, but here's a twelve hundred dollar check. That should help you, right?" Um, <laughs> I, that, that that's been a big fighting point with me, like in, in trying to draw people's attention to government inefficiencies. You know, I'm I'm like the government literally just said, "All life is paused." They, they put people out of work. They put people in worrying situations where people are losing their businesses. People don't have an income now. And their solution was, okay, we'll, we'll pass this little you know, $1,200 stimulus check. Here you go. Well, let me ask you, have you talked about the inefficiencies of the FDA with, with regard to coronavirus? Um, that is something that uh, you know, I actually honestly haven't touched up on. Okay. Um, well, because well, I, I would like to point something out to you that a lot of people overlook. First of all, a lot of people don't realize that before 1962, you only had to prove safety to the FDA in order to get your drug out there. After 1962, you have to prove efficacy. In other words, that your drug does what it says it will do. Now, that sounds like a noble cause, but the problem is, is it's, it's another obstacle. That's why it costs at least a billion dollars just to introduce a new drug. 
And that's why there were so many obstacles to testing, because everybody agreed up front, you know, the, the more people we get tested, the more we know who has the virus, who needs to stay home, and who can be outside. So basically, there were something like 60 different American companies coming up with testing kits, and the FDA only approved two of them. And, you know, you look at, well, where did the other testing kits go? They went around the world. We kept hearing about how, for instance, people in Southeast Asia were doing a great job with testing. Yeah, they were doing a great job because they were using our testing kits that we weren't allowed to use. So had I been Trump, what I would have done is Emergency Powers Act. I would have said, OK, FDA, you no longer have to prove efficacy, just uh, safety to get your drug out or to get your testing kit out. And by the way, the free market does a really good job of sorting out what works and what doesn't work. And of course, large companies don't want their reputations tarnished. And the other thing I would have done if I were Trump is not to say, hey, you only need to get tested if you show symptoms. Because at the time, the prevailing wisdom was that something like 60 to 80 percent of people with the virus either had no symptoms or very minor symptoms. So in that case, you could have the virus not know it, not get tested because you feel fine, and then spread it to a bunch of people. So once again, we've got, you know, when people ask me why I run for, why I'm running for president, I tell them that government is too big, too bossy, too nosy, too intrusive, and worst of all, it usually hurts those it intends to help. So the FDA is a prime example. The FDA comes along and says, we're gonna make stuff that's safe and efficacious, but what do they do? They're another roadblock, uh, so now we don't get tested. Absolutely, and that it is amazing to see that we can look at other countries that had the testing down and yep. basically didn't have to stall their economies for a very yep. long time. They didn't have to inadvertently impact people on the largest scale ever. Uh, right, so the, so the rest of the world gets the benefit of American ingenuity, and we don't. America's own citizens don't get the advantage of Americans' inventiveness, and it's just so frustrating. Yes, yes, and and not only that, I'm glad you brought up the FDA angle, but I do recall when at, at the very start of it with uh, masks, there was a shortage of masks, and it was the yep. same thing. Red tapes in place that didn't allow companies to produce masks because they had to meet certain criteria to be approved for use uh, for those purposes. So, yep. and again, the Americans are just so great and so inventive. Even the pillow guy is out there making thousands of masks. So, yeah. We can do it if government would just get out of the way. Government is the one who causes the problems and individuals overcome them. And now it's Trump and Biden. We've just got same old, same old, as the media keeps saying, two old rich white guys uh, who are going to give you the same thing we've gotten for the past 60 years, which is government in the way. Absolutely. And now I want to walk back to polling uh, because I've noticed this uh, as I've been paying attention more and more. I see polls coming out from news organizations and uh, data collection agencies on social media. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of your name excluded from it. I don't know if you've been noticing that. No, I haven't. But I got to say, if they're excluding it is because they're afraid, because I have seen some online polls which show me in first place. Now, of course, those are skewed polls, so you can't uh, take much stock in them. But it does show that there's a lot of people out there who are fed up. And the most exciting thing about our campaign so far is from the start, we've had so many non-Libertarian Party volunteers volunteer uh, for my campaign. Usually what happens is when you first run for office, you get your you know little core group, you get your friends, they all pitch in, and then you spread the message and other people join. We've had people joining from you know the very first day who not not a member of the party, never helped with the libertarian campaign, but you know what? They want something different. They want real change. That's actually, that's a pretty amazing point to make. Um, in reaching out, I mean, I remember I recall you saying in debates and, and I absolutely agreed with you in running for president. We could run some libertarian guy and, and we have pretty much all the libertarian votes on lock. But does that really matter if we're not expanding the party, if we're not broadening the message, if it's not if it's if there's no growth, then are we really accomplishing anything like is it is it it's not a victory in my eyes and I would imagine it's not in your eyes. 
if you run for president and you get every registered libertarian, but nobody outside of that. Exactly, because you have to grow the movement and not necessarily members, but just growing the movement and getting people out there who want a real change. And I I will consider it a victory if I'm on the ballot in all 50 states and we give people a real alternative, the only alternative. However, we've got to set set the bar higher. And what we've got to do is grow the movement and uh, get the word out there. And I think we're doing that. Absolutely. Also on polling, too, uh, the, the presidential debates, which mm-hmm. aren't being talked about at all right now. It's, it's nope. amazing. N- not a word is going on about this. I actually had to uh, get on Google and search to figure out that there are three dates st- set for them come, I believe, way later, like October. Um, but we already know anyway, the, uh, the Commission on Presidential Debates, they don't like to include us. They like to set high thresholds. Uh, I, I knew last, uh, in 2016, it was 15%. I think it's still 15% now. Yeah, in fact, uh, we recently, lo- we meaning not just the Libertarian Party, but groups of people got together. And uh, we recently lost a court case in trying to get us in the debates without going through that number. And yes, it's still 15%. But notice what they did, and, and of course they did this after Ross Pro, John Anderson, and the other challengers, what they did was they looked at the number and said, okay, what number can we come up with that's low enough that looks kind of reasonable that nobody would think that we're rigging the system, but high enough that nobody can ever meet. So so that's how they got their 15%. Yeah, notice Gary Johnson got to 13.6%. So it looks like their statisticians did a good job with that. But you know that they did that to keep us off the stage. Absolutely. And then they get to they they have full control of it anyway. They can cherry pick the polls that they want you to meet 15 percent in and all that. So that's a hurdle. Yeah. And let me add, they did that with Tulsi Gabbard, too, the the biggest anti-war Democrat. And it's such a shame because the Democratic Party traditionally has been the anti-war pro-peace party. And the Democratic Party basically just shut her down. And so I would like to mention for any of you disenfranchised uh, Democrats, my platform is to bring our troops home, to turn America into one giant Switzerland armed and neutral. I would slash the military budget. There's no reason we need to be around the world. And Tulsi Gabbard was exactly right on that. And when it came to the debates and some of the polls, they basically gave her a hard time because they didn't want her voice heard. Absolutely. Um, With that being said, we, we have Trump's response on... The, the current events going on, the, back to criminal justice reform, we have Donald Trump's response, uh, law and order, which I loved your tweet uh, in response to him about, I guess you don't understand what freedom and liberty mean. Yeah. But, so we have we have Donald Trump. He's, he's definitely, you know, going more the iron fist route, law and order. Uh, we have Joe Biden, who's saying that he's going to magically walk back his 30 plus years of, <laughs> of the opposite of this stuff. What is uh, what's the libertarian message out there on this is what needs to be done? Because people hear people hear phrases like defund the police. And again, uh, people get emotionally charged by these things. They don't want to really research what the messaging is and all that. How like how do we approach that? Well, first of all, crime is a local issue. If you talk about burglary, robbery, assault, so forth, those are local issues. That should be left up to the local police, the police with the mayor, city council, taxpayers, voters, and so on. There is no reason for the federal government to get involved. And that is has has been what's escalated everything. A lot of people don't realize that the federal government has been equipping police departments with, you know, tanks, anti-grenade launchers. In fact, I heard of a school district being awarded an, an anti-grenade or, or rather a grenade launcher. Um, so they give out all of this military equipment, give out free training, give out extra money for extra military equipment. So what they've done is they've militarized the police. So no longer do they have the attitude of we're here to protect and serve as what's on their cop cars. But now it's kind of an us versus them mentality. And I don't want America to be at war with other countries, and I certainly don't want it to be at war with its own citizens. So the first thing I would do is I would stop militarizing local police departments. I wouldn't give them tanks. I wouldn't give them money. I wouldn't give them training. I would say, you know what? This is a local issue. 
for instance, people in rural Appalachia, different needs, different desires than people in, let's say, downtown uh, New York. Let's them, let's let them handle it themselves. So uh, once again, I think the government had a big hand in actually causing this problem. So basically, what what I'm getting from that is that there needs to be a, a more of a rise in people's awareness of what's going on locally rather than on a national federal level. Well, and, and you're right about that, but the problem is, is just being aware of it doesn't help. For instance, let's say that uh, there was going to be a referendum in your city or town, a town of 50,000, 100,000, whatever. And they asked you, would you like your taxes to go up to pay for, I don't know, renovating the school or creating a new park. Some people might say yes, some people might say no, but you know, a local issue. Now imagine a referendum where they say, okay, do you want your taxes to go up so we can buy a tank for your police department? <laughs> Probably every American citizen would say, no, I don't want my money spent on tanks. You know, I'd rather have it put into the school. But what's happening is the federal government is taxing people with a very high tax rate, taking that money into Washington, then they buy the grenade launchers and so forth, go back to the police departments, dangle it, and say, hey, would you like a free tank? Now, who's going to turn that down? Because people are going to figure, well, that's our taxpayer dollars. Um, so you know, I don't want the people in Texas to get it. You know, I don't want the people in Alabama to get it. So I'm going to take that free tank. So, uh, so even if they are aware, how do you stop that? The only way to stop it is to, again, reduce the size and scope of government. We need to get rid of the federal income tax so that the government doesn't have that money to use against us, to buy stuff that we don't want, and that hurts us, that makes things worse. So your view on taxes overall, I mean, they you hear a lot of libertarians drop the taxation as theft line. Um, when talking about taxes, though, do you believe that it is more so limit the amount that the government can collect, the ways that the government co can collect it, and that, in, in, a, in a sense, kind of constricts what they can do? Well, I, I mean, uh, all, yes to all of the above. First of all, I believe the functions of government are police, courts, and military. We don't need government, uh, you know, we don't need the federal government telling us about health care or getting into our retirement, which by the way, what do we have? A broken down social security system, which is dreadful. So if we reduce government to that scope, taxes would be so low that people wouldn't even mind. So what we need to do is we need to uh, get government out of social security. What I would like to do there is have an immediate opt out for younger people. Uh, they know that they're never going to see those Social Security dollars. They know it's a broken system. So an immediate opt-out so that you're not throwing away your money so you can start saving money for a secure retirement. For seniors who've been putting money in for decades, what I would say is, you know what? That money was not going into a lockbox, like Al Gore told you. Uh, the government's been spending it. So what we're going to do is we're going to sell government assets, such as downtown buildings, office space, uh, mineral rights, water rights, whatever. And then we're going to give you your money back. And now you're going to have a secure retirement. It's not going to be under the whims of Congress. You're not going to have to worry about the latest cost of living increase. You will have control over it because guess what? You're getting your money back. It should have never been taken to begin with. I think that that approach is, is far better than when you hear somebody say, well, I just want to abolish Social Security. You know, yeah. it, obviously, there needs to be some kind of plan in, in place that progressively, you know, weans America off of it, kind of. And and you have a valid point in that uh, the, the people that have paid into it for so long, it, it essentially was just stolen from you. It, you know, yeah. when I for me growing up. Uh, I'm 31 right now, but all my life I've been told in school, uh, <laughs> by politicians, by everything that, yeah, yeah, Social Security eventually ain't going to be there for you. So you got to figure out something on your own. And it, it, it's sad to say that because I still look at every paycheck and go, huh, oh, that's money I'm never going to see again. Yeah. And, and I'd like to mention, you make a good point calling it stolen. Think about it. This money was taken out of their paycheck before they even got their paycheck. They had absolutely no choice. No choice whatsoever. Again, it's the government saying we're here to help you, and instead they make things worse. And in that, a as you would phase it out, would that um, would there be other 
government involvement for the people who actually need it or kind of branching out to to link it with charities and offering more choice and you know more diversity is, is that how that would work you mean just government in general yeah yeah the more we can get government out of things the better it is so for instance you mentioned charity uh, a great example would be the United Way from the early 90s. The president bought something like $400,000 worth of fancy artwork, which, by the way, in today's dollars would be worth closer to a million dollars. And what happened was donations started drying up. The donors were saying, you know what? We gave you this money to help those who need it. We didn't give it to you for uh, fancy artwork. So United Way had to work its butt off to convince everybody to show that they could be trusted with their dollars. Now, imagine that same money goes to the federal government. Uh, there's a lot of high overhead in federal government. And what happens if they don't do a good job spending it? Well, they just raise taxes and they just keep spending it on layer after layer after layer of bureaucracy. So we need a real change in which people are held accountable. Uh, private run charities are held much more accountable than people in the federal government. And what I find ironic is people like, oh, Oprah Winfrey and, uh, uh, Bill Gates, they're talking about how they should be, t at least I believe both of them say this, that they want to, they think that taxes should be higher. They want government to do more. And yet both of them are doing money or are, are doing very good work with their own money. You know, uh, Oprah Winfrey started her school in Africa. Bill Gates has the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And my question to Bill Gates is, okay, if you think that the government does such a great job, why don't you just give the federal government your money and let them spend it. Why do you have your own foundation? Obviously, he, you know, if you, you know, actions speak louder than words. Obviously, he thinks he can do a better job of getting services to those who need it than the federal government, or he simply would have, you know, turned it over to them. That's that's a very good point, and just in the fact that he wouldn't want the control of the federal government over that money because he knows <laughs> exactly. he does it because he knows he does it more efficiently than them. So basically yeah in fact uh, what, while you're at it let's just turn over the the you know microsoft you know if the government does such a great job running things let's just turn over control of microsoft to the federal government what do you think about that bill gates <laughs> yeah yeah it never would never would happen never would happen um uh in wrapping up um our conversation because i know i could only have you for a little bit of time we we're, we're a little bit over we're about to hit 40 minutes and um is, is there any other topic that we didn't hit that you want to hit on real quick? Well, of course, I want to send people to my website, which is joj2020.com. And I think we miss, we hit most of the high, um, you know, the high points, which is basically, if you're Republican, you see that Trump gave you bigger government. If you're a Democrat, you can see now we've got war hawks in place. And we've got Joe Biden, who's been part of the problem. If you're looking for a real change for real people, to please come to my website and take a look and check us out. Is that is that the primary source people should go to if they want to help with your campaign as well? Yes, joj2020.com. And also, if you're not so politically inclined to go check out websites, uh, when November comes around, please vote for me. And uh, let's show the Democrats and Republicans that it's time to end their reign of royalty, that it's time for us to take back control for us. Absolutely. One last word, and you don't have to go on on it. What do you say to the people who would say, nah, if you vote for Joe Jorgensen, you're helping out Donald Trump, or no, if you vote for Joe Jorgensen, you're definitely helping out Joe Biden? I would say statistics show you wrong, that we draw equally from both groups, but that most people who vote for us have either never voted or vote independent because they realize it's basically the red team versus the blue team. And I would just ask real quick, do you think government is too big or do you think government is too small? And if they laugh when I ask them if government is too small, then I say, why are you gonna vote for bigger government? They're going to give you just what you don't want. Perfect. Dr. Jorgensen, thank you for uh, joining me on the show and giving me your time. And I appreciate uh, you coming on the show. Oh, absolutely. Had a great time. Thanks.